good evening. As we said before, this is the year of Mars. In the late summer, the red planet will be as close to us as it can ever get. Less than 35 million miles. That would be brilliant. Brighter than anything else in the sky, apart from the sun, the moon and Venus, high up in the southern sky. And uh, Mars, therefore, is very much in our thoughts, and a British-built probe is shortly going to be sent there. Now, here's a globe of Mars, a world smaller than we are, further away from the sun, therefore colder, but the one world where there might be a certain amount of life that we can detect. Here we have the globe. The dark areas were once thought to be seas. Well, they can't be seas. The atmosphere on Mars is very thin, and there can't be large stretches of liquid water there. There are some of the areas where the red, dusty stuff has been blown away by winds in the thin Martian atmosphere. And these are the Oka Plains. This one is a disparity of special interest to us because a British probe is going to be sent there. You know, I go back to the time when we thought there might be Martian canals and intelligent life. Well, we now know there are no Martians, no little green men, nothing to advance as a blade of grass, but there may be primitive life, and we're very keen to find out, and we hope Beagle 2 will tell us. So, at this stage, may introduce the man behind Beagle 2, Professor Colin Penninger. Hi, Patrick. First of all, why Beagle 2? Well, we thought we'd name it after the voyage of HMS Beagle, which took Charles Darwin around the world and led to our understanding of uh, life on Earth. And since this is the next great voyage of exploration, it's very appropriate we call it Beagle 2. Well, we have here a scale model of Beagle 2. First full scale, all, full scale. Exactly. First of all, how is it going to get there? It will fly on a, a Russian Soyuz Fregat rocket. It takes off from Kazakhstan. When? In beginning of June is the new best date, June the 6th. It takes it exactly seven months to get there. If uh, all goes according to plan, it will arrive on December the 27th. And how will Beagle land? Uh, a combination of things. It enters the Martian atmosphere at high velocity behind a heat shield and slows down against the frictional heating of the atmosphere. Then a, a pilot parachute is fired out using a mortar, and then a big parachute opens out, a much bigger parachute, and this finally slows you down to about 40 miles an hour. And, but when you strike the surface, it's cocooned in gas-filled bags because, of course, the delicate spacecraft would still break up if it hit 40 miles an hour. Of course, they're not the first lander. Uh, no, indeed. There were two American landers in 1976 Vikings, called Vikings, yes. which I'm sure you remember and indeed, I tried to indeed. be involved in. Um, also, there was a Pathfinder lander in 1997, but this will be the first time Europe has been involved in a, a space mission to Mars, and most definitely the first time Britain has been involved in a lander. Well, here we have our full-scale model. Colin, will you show us exactly what it's about? Well, everything is pre-programmed in that I've shown you, that I've talked to you about before, but when we get down on the surface, after a matter of minutes, there is a device that breaks a clamp band around the outside and frees the lid so that uh, it can uh, be hope opened by uh, a hinge driven here. Then the solar arrays will fall, fold out and this gives us an opportunity to start charging the battery. It's all pre-programmed, is it? This is all pre-programmed in. We can't do anything until we get a picture of where we are. The yeah. way to get the instant picture to tell people we've arrived is that the solar arrays will actually allow this little mirror to pop up. And one of the cameras faces up, and you can see a reflection in this uh, convex mirror of the surrounding. So we'll be trying to get that first picture back to you within a matter of hours. What will the first pictures show? Uh, it won't show any little green men no, peering in. <laughs> no uh, hopefully it will show the surroundings, and once we've got that picture of the surroundings, then we know what to do. By the way, why did you do Is it this Regio? Uh, a variety of reasons. It's uh, engineeringly favourable, but it's also interesting from the science point of view. It's engineeringly appropriate because it's relatively flat. There's about 14% of boulders, so enough to make the geologists happy, not enough to scare the engineers off. Uh, it's below the Martian datum, so we have a thicker atmosphere to slow the parachutes down. When you start to think about, is it interesting for scientists? Well, it's probably a, an ancient crater which has been filled in by sedimentary debris. Uh, but there are, if you look at the, carefully at the uh, orbiter pictures that we already have, you can see evidence that, in fact, there may have been volatile emissions from volcanoes. Volatile emissions, of course, mean water. 
Exactly. And water is exactly what you want if you're going to go looking for life. We've landed them on Mars. Uh, we've we've landed. We've sent you a message to say we're there, and we've uh, we're now into a f probably a couple of days after landing. We can get the robotic arm lifted up, and we want to use these two cameras here, and we want to get the arm right up to its full extent and turn it through 360 degrees with a view to getting a panoramic picture, three-dimensional panoramic picture. The real reason why we have to get those panels out is to get the battery charging. And we're actually going to run Beagle mostly through a battery. At any one time when the battery is fully charged, we only have 160 watt hours, which is a you know, decent electric light bulb for an hour exactly, and a half. Exactly, yes. Um, that allows us to run the experiments. And there are a series of uh, spectrometers on the uh, on the uh, robotic arm here. And what do they do? Uh, there's a microscope. Yeah. On the, apart from the two cameras, there's a microscope. There's this device here, which is called a Mossbauer spectrometer. That gives you a mineralogy of the rocks. At the end here is a chemical spectrometer using X-rays to give you the chemical compositions. So you put these two th together, and you find out what kind of rocks it is you're, you're going to be analyzing. What do you expect? Um, so far, nobody's found a sedimentary rock of any kind, but part of the difficulty in previous ex expeditions is that nobody actually got inside the rocks. They okay. just looked at the dust cover on the outside. Okay. And that's the reason why we have this device here, which is our grinder corer. It, you put that up against a rock, you can take off the outside weathered rind, which is going to be very, uh, not very interesting, drill into the rock, get an interior piece, and it's the interior piece that will tell you about, uh, you know, what is the real nature of the rock. The one that was a sojourner probe that went there earlier, and that was mobile, but this is static, isn't it? Uh, it's static up to a point. We do have this device called the Mole, which is uh, maybe uh, not as uh, photogenic as uh, no. Sojourner, but it's still able to crawl across the surface. It's got a mechanism inside that allows it to tap across, tap its way across the surface. How far? Uh, the length of the cable is two and a half, three meters. Oh, well. the, but the most important thing that the mole can do that no rover has ever been able to do, get below the surface. Yes. Get below the surface because that's the place where you are going to find evidence of past life on Mars, if it exists. Ice? Uh, not necessarily. I don't think we can go far enough. But we can put this into places under boulders where you might be in a, re uh, a regime of permanent shade. And that's the sort of place where you might find some volatiles trapped out. It's also the sort of place where the rocks have never been exposed to the harsh Martian UV, and the dust hasn't been turned over by the wind. So it's going to be more pristine than anywhere else you can study. What kind of life do you expect, if, you, if, if any at all? Well, the, the primary purpose of uh, Beagle is to uh, look for past life. So what we will be doing is look for minerals that have been deposited from water. Because on Earth, when you find minerals that are deposited from water, such as carbonates, then within those minerals are the organic debris of the organisms that lived in the water, or the living things that were washed into the basins where the sediments were deposited. So you look for the evidence of water produced minerals, and then you look for organic matter within associated with those minerals because when you find that scenario on earth and every rock that has ever been studied that is produced like that you see the organics and the minerals together and they have a distinct carbon isotopic signature which suggests that biology has been involved if we do find any trace of life we'd be able to that of course is the answer to your question if we don't it still isn't a total answer because it's only uh, one, one earlier the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence exactly. i'm sure you heard that one before i have indeed <laughs> of all the experiments there's one in which you are particularly concerned and that is the open university experiment yes this is this uh, here is where we put the samples that we get from the Cora grinder or the mole. And uh, the instrument which is inside actually generates quite a lot of warmth. So we keep it inside because it helps to keep the rest of the lander going. This is the Open University's mass spectrometer and gas analysis package in here. There's a, an entry port here for, the, uh, for putting samples in, which feeds into a funnel. And uh, inside is the gas analysis package. If you look down in there, you can see the various little ovens that uh, we use to extract the, sam the gases from samples. There's a mass spectrometer, 
which is able to uh, analyse for carbon, nitrogen and hydrogen, which of course is the main constituent of water. It's able to do chemical processing so that we can uh, uh, look for things that uh, measure, measure isotopes and things like that. We should be able to date rocks, and that would be the first time a rock has ever been dated in situ on a planet, if we can obtain an age of when the rock was formed and when the rock was deposited on the surface. But of course, looking for carbon is its main purpose, because carbon is the, the basis of life, and we want to look for carbon as the residue from things that perhaps used to live on Mars. Well, Colin, we've been talking about evidence of possible past life on Mars. Is there any chance at all of finding evidence for present life on Mars, however lowly? Well, we've, we've included it in the uh, manifest of the experiments that we'll do. One of the things that the, the mass spectrometer can actually measure is the composition of the atmosphere. And it's able to take samples of the atmosphere and remove the main constituents, such as carbon dioxide and nitrogen, with a view to concentrating minor constituents. And what we'll be looking for is the existence of a, a constituent which is out of equilibrium. The most obvious one to look for is a reduced gas. The one most indicative of life is methane. Because on Earth, methane is the product of metabolic processes. It's the simplest metabolic process to reduce carbon dioxide to get energy. So very simple organisms do this. If there were simple organisms on Mars using that process, they would kick into the atmosphere their waste product. It wouldn't matter where they were or where Beagle landed, the atmosphere circulation would bring a trace of that methane to the Beagle 2 landing site. If we can process a lot of gas, we may be able to find methane. I can cast my mind back to the 1970s and the two Viking landers, one in Chrysi, one in Utopia. And uh, after that experiment, I think many people thought there was no life there, never had been. Those landers carried very specific experiments. There were experiments that sort of exposed the soil to radioactive nutrients and also exposed the soil to radioactive gases in the hope that some metabolizing organism would use those radioactive compounds. And in fact, at first, it appeared that they had success. They began to see results that suggested the radio-labeled materials were being used. I remember that. And, uh, but the, the scientists were incredibly responsible about this. They thought very carefully about it. The real problem that they had was that uh, if there was something living there, they had to be able to find a body. And they had an experiment on board that looked for organic matter through pyrolyzing the sample. Didn't find it. When they pyrolyzed the sample, they couldn't find any organic matter more in amount than the actual solvents they'd used to clean the apparatus. So they had to conclude that Mars was playing them a big confidence trick and the oxidized surface of Mars was in fact behaving chemically like a biological organism. And so they didn't conclude that they hadn't found life, they just concluded that they hadn't found any evidence of it, hoping that we'd be back in, on Mars within a, you know, a few years to get some more conclusive experiments done. Well, what's your guess? Are you going to find it? Um, my guess is that uh, we've learned an awful lot from meteorites that we know come from Mars. Uh, if meteorites that we've studied on Earth were terrestrial rocks, no one would doubt that we'd discover life on Earth. However, because we're looking at a Martian rock... Antarctica. Antarctic a rock that has come, I mean, in fact, even from some other parts of the, the globe, you know, hot deserts and things like that, because you're looking for a rock that has spent a long time on Earth, you have the serious problem that it may have been contaminated oh, by yeah. terrestrial biology. And since we can't prove that it hasn't, we can't say that the information that comes out of the meteorite is truly Martian. And so what we're really doing with Beagle 2 is to take this mass spectrometer back there to repeat all the experiments that we did on meteorites on Earth. If they come out the same, then we'll be able to say to people, well, sorry, we've put this mass spectrometer and this instrument and this lander together in such an environment that we can preclude that the whole thing was contaminated and therefore you've got to accept the results at face value. Uh, so far, how is everything going? Well, Beagle is uh, currently at the, uh, the launch pad. It's uh, waiting to be joined on to Mars Express. We've had a trial fit. Everything seems to be okay. Mars Express itself is uh, uh, a little behind schedule, but uh, we're making, you know, this is the first European Mars probe 
We don't want to take any risks. So. What exactly is the timetable then? It lifts off in June. Lift off in June, landing a couple of days after Christmas. Experiments taking place over the next six months. We expect uh, to be uh, doing things, because of this low power, we expect to be doing things over a long period of time. And we'll keep the public and the media and yourself informed with the results as we get them. Well, you'll certainly watch on the sky at night, but how long do you think you'll be able to operate? It's suggested that we can keep going for six months. It, the, the solar arrays will degrade, but as long as you can get the battery with sufficient charge in to get through the night, you can have enough, ex enough power to run the experiment. If it works, then what comes next? The sample and return probe? Um, my feeling is that we will probably have at least one more robotic mission before we go for sample return. We're already talking about sample return in Europe with a possible uh, launch of around 2011. Most of the people who work in laboratories on Earth would be happy with what we call a grab-and-go sample. Yes, exactly. Because the geologists these days are so, or the people who do Earth sciences these days, they have such powerful techniques that an individual grain is like a boulder. We can date individual grains, we can analyze them, we can characterize them, we can tell their history. So, so we don't need big rocks anymore. So, summing up, what do you think are the chances of success and what do you really think is going to come out of it compared with previous probes? Well, there's a sort of about a 50% chance of success with Martian probes. We hope we're doing better than that. We've tried sort of plugging all our parameters into a model and trying to keep the success rate as high as we can. And of course, that it can only be done by, if you have to solve a problem one pace, you have to take mass or some part of the system away to fix it. We like to think that we have thought as hard about this problem as we can. And if we don't succeed, it won't be because people haven't tried hard enough. We've tried our utmost. Well, I think it will succeed. It is a British project. And may, many congratulations, Colin. If this works, and I think it will, you can learn the most exciting thing, well, in human history probably, the probable discovery of possible life on another world. I'll come back and tell you about it, Patrick. Please do. Colin, thank you very much. So, Beagle 2 will soon be on its way. I'm sure it'll work, and we'll keep you fully informed. Don't forget now, it's newsletter time. If you want your newsletter, send your steps of assembly to newsletter number 89, BBC at the Sky at Night, White City, room 5350, London, W12 7TS. CVAX, page 620. And also, there's still time to send in your designs for a Martian base. And you'll find details there on our website, www.bbc.co.uk slash space. And when I come back next month, I'll be talking about three really exciting things happening in May, all should be seen from here. The transit of Mercury, the total eclipse of the Moon, and of course the annular eclipse of the Sun. So until then, good night.